Great. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Dan. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about satellite ammonia measurements, which are relatively new measurements compared to uh, uh, what we historically have measured by satellite. And we're going to talk today a little bit about the current status, um, where they're, uh, what's available, and how we can use them, and also what do we still need a little bit more work on? Where should we use caution, or where should we decide the best practices are to use the data in certain areas or types of conditions. I want to uh, also acknowledge uh, Ray Wong, Shu Wei Guo, and Christopher Beal. Uh, they are graduate students and postdocs in my research group who have done uh, an awful lot of work with the Yazi and Chris teams and helping put together uh, this presentation and in general just trying to understand how can we get the most out of satellite ammonia measurements to help stakeholders. Okay, so why ammonia? I assume everyone on here has um, some, obviously, interest in ammonia. Uh, but if you don't, ammonia is really important because it's a critical precursor uh, for aerosol species. Most of the emissions of ammonia are coming from agriculture, from either livestock waste or fertilizer application. Uh, the relative components of other sources, such as industrial vehicles, generally are pretty small. They have, may have local impacts, but generally ammonia comes from agriculture. And we often think of aerosol composition because of the way it's measured by mass, but in terms of the chemistry, it happens by, by mole. And because ammonia, ammonia or ammonium, the, the particulate phase, is you know, mass 18, when you normalize it by mass compared to nitrate, sulfate, and organics, it often is a very little sliver on the pie chart, but I just took this example, which is fairly representative of urban areas. Um, so aerosol composition, ammonium is a really important component of PM 2.5. And then once these ammoniated aerosols um, go into the atmosphere, they can deposit through wet deposition, as shown uh, up here in the uh, upper right panel. This is from the National Atmosphere Deposition Program. You can see incredible amounts of ammonium deposition throughout the center and eastern part of the country. But also, if you look at, um, say, the Sierras, you know, you see wet deposition of ammonium and also valleys throughout the west. In fact, in terms of nitrogen deposition, ammonia dry deposition, ammonium uh, wet deposition are becoming the dominant sources of nitrogen to ecosystems as opposed to uh, nitric acid and nitrate. So now that nitrate and nitrogen and ammonia and all forms of nitrogen uh, combine and they go into ecosystems and then you have this excess nitri nitrogen deposition which, which leads to all sorts of uh, ecological problems, loss of diversity, uh, eutrophication of surface waters. And what's shown in the lower right are kind of where is there excess nitrogen deposition in federal class one areas such as national parks, and by and large, with the exception of maybe around the four corners, um, every national park in the U.S. has excess nitrogen, nitrogen deposition. So we really need to understand how ammonia plays a role, what are the emissions, and where is it coming from. One other point, um, it, it's not just about ecosystem, and it's not about uh, just about uh, ammonium deposition. It also matters for air quality, and what's shown on the lower left is a recent study in Nature Sustainability that came out last year. And it showed, this study was looking at corn production and how air pollution impacts uh, mortality. And they broke it up into you know, total PM 2.5, and you can see down here on the left that of the PM 2.5, the secondary PM 2.5, the biggest component is ammonia. So ammonia directly leads to particulate pollution. And in this case, they were focusing on corn, and they came up with the fact that corn leads to about 10,000 deaths every year just from this, largely because of increased uh, ammonia emissions from fertilizer. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you ammonium is important and ammonia. But what do we have that's out there? And in about 2007, the Ammonia Monitoring Network was put together. Um, it currently exists of about 120 stations, although some have, are no longer operational and some are fairly new. But this shows the average ammonia, ammonia gas phase ammonia concentration uh, throughout the 
sites that have a long-term record. And what you can see is by the warm colors, the yellows, oranges, and, and reds, again, it seems to match up pretty well with the center of the country. But again, you see a lot of the western areas where we have measurements are really high. In fact, the highest level by about a factor of three in the entire network is located in northern Utah. But you can also see there are some fairly strong gradients of stations that are placed uh, pretty close together. So, for example, in this Utah, it's about three times higher than a nearby station. In terms of Colorado, you can see it's an order of magnitude higher over a short distance. So we know ammonia has a short lifetime. We know that we should expect to see large spatial gradients. But how does this really look in, in the grand scheme of things? And quite frankly, we just don't have the resolution to really tell us that much. This is an amazing uh, network. Uh, it's growing. It tells us a lot about ground and surface validation of ammonia. And we'll talk about how satellites can play a role where we take these two uh, types of measurements, the ground-based measurements and satellite, and we can really learn a lot more uh, from that's greater than the sum of each individual part. Um, I'm not going to show here, but each of these sites also has really large temporal variations. Month-to-month -month variations are huge. Okay, so I want to take a look at this highest Amon site, uh, which is in northern Utah, uh, near Logan, Utah. Uh, it's called UT01. And this is a Google Earth image of the site. And you can see there's Logan. It's located to the southwest of Logan. So, okay, is there anything special? Well, we know it's in a valley. We know there is high agricultural activity in this area. So these are all the type of things that should concentrate ammonia and perhaps cause it to be, as it shows, the highest in the country. But as we start zooming in on this site, we can see it's in an agricultural area. You can see all the fields. But if you actually look at the site on the left here, it's kind of this little uh, rectangular gray square, which is where the measurement is made. It's immediately adjacent to a large cattle feeding operation. So trying to understand, like, is this high because it's right next to a really big source? Or if the wind is, say, blowing from the northwest, and maybe it doesn't matter, and it completely is representative of that valley. And satellites can do a, a big help in trying to understand these type of differences. So we're going to come back to this when we talk about the satellite data and kind of say, is this site also the highest in the entire country? So if we put the site five kilometers away, would it see the same high levels? Okay, so now we get to satellites to help us all. There are uh, four satellites. Actually, there's a fifth one, um, but I'm showing the four main ones that are producing products and are publicly available right now. Um, there's the YAZI, the Infrared Atmospheric Sound Interferometer Instrument, which is on two satellites, METOP A and B. Uh, this satellite and this data set I'm going to be talking about a lot. The local, it crosses the equator one, well, actually twice per day, but the nighttime measurements don't have the sensitivity. So the daytime measurements are around early to mid-morning, around between, say, 8.45 and 10 o'clock. It's reasonably small resolution. I mean, only 12 kilometers. And the thing that's really nice about Yazi, it has a long record. It goes back to 2007. It produces a column. And for those of you who aren't familiar, column is looking at the entire amount of ammonia over the surface uh, surface area of the Earth, so it does not get vertical profiles. And then there are other components that I, that I show here that I'm not going to get into, the noise, how big it is. But the key thing is the pixels are about 12 kilometers. And the next product I'll talk about for a satellite is the CRIS satellite, which is a cross-track infrared sounder. Uh, this is a relatively newer uh, satellite with a little bit uh, better noise, but comparable uh, size of the pixel, but you know, again, that 10 to 15 kilometer range. This is now available from 2014 to the present. Uh, the CRIS team has um, you know, more degrees of freedom available, so they actually get a full vertical profile. And just to show immediately below this, you can kind of see, I keep hitting this, sorry about this. Um, this is the Yazi swath, so you, know, you can see as the satellite, sorry, I must be hitting something here. As, as the satellite goes across the Earth, it's looking, it's sweeping to the left and right and looking across in what this is called a swath. 
And so the Yazi and Chris have comparable size swaths. The pixel size are the same, but if you notice, Chris has a much higher density of pixels. So whereas Yazi, you can see these gaps between it. So although they have similar, similar pixel size, Chris actually has higher density. Um, what that means is you can get similar types of maps um, if you average over time, even though it's a shorter time scale, um, they can with Yazi going all the way back to 2007, and I'll show some of that. I do want to mention tests and errors. Those instruments on the Oron Aqua satellites, respectively, also measure ammonia. Uh, TESS is really no longer operational, um, but it was really the pioneer in, in measuring atmospheric ammonia. It started back in 2004. Uh, AIRS has started in 2002, although really uh, didn't become a, a product until later on. AIRS is still measuring. Uh, its monthly profiles or concentrations are available, but in terms of, you know, raw data or, you know, level one type data, uh, it's still in the process of being worked on. So because of that, I'm going to really talk about Yazi and to a lesser extent Chris today, because those are the two most promising uh, satellite ammonia measurements. So what do we want to think about with satellite ammonia? So there are kind of two levels. There's, you know, kind of a practical side of things, like how are we going to use them? But there's also, a, 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 for better terms, a logistical side. You know, how accurate are they? Is the overpass time representative to other times of day? Do the measurements agree with one another? These are really important things, but probably things people like me and others on the team really look at but I think it's important for users to be aware of what the outstanding issues. And then if you're aware of that, then, you know, well, how can we use satellites? Um, in what applications are they really going to change the way we think about uh, atmospheric ammonia? Uh, where should we use these with caution? And what are the future opportunities for sensing? So I'm going to start out with uh, probably a perhaps more boring component, and I'll go over it fairly quickly just to give you a state of the art about validation of satellite ammonia. Uh, what's shown down on the lower left corner is the NASA P-3B aircraft. There was a study done in Colorado where the aircraft would spiral over a number of sites. Um, you know, and then what's shown in the upper left, this cross is where the Yazi pixel was centered. The circle is about a 15 kilometer radius, the size of the pixel. And then you can actually see all these uh, red and, and blue and yellow are various ammonia measurements from the airplane, from other aircraft, from ground-based measurements. So we can kind of use that data within this pixel, and then we can arrange, say, well, what is it within, say, 45 kilometers of the pixel, and what is it within an hour of the overpass time versus three hours? And look at the space-time agreement, because ammonia does have a short lifetime. So if you average too large in space and time, what you measure by the satellite may have nothing to do with where you're trying to validate it against. So there were a number of measurements made in this field study. I'm not going to go into them. But the, the key is that we had aircraft profiles of ammonia, which really we have not had uh, very often in the past. So here's an example of one of the profiles. Um, of course, we are in Colorado, so the ground's at about 1,600 meters or 1.6 kilometers. Um, this shows measurements of ammonia, and you can see it's highly variable. Um, at first thought, you say, wow, this is a noisy instrument, but it's, it's not, it's actually a really good instrument. It's just there is tremendous variability of ammonia, even within the atmosphere. Now, the aircraft went up to about four kilometers uh, above sea level, and then it went back in, and flew elsewhere and did another profile, which brings us to an issue of, well, what's happening above four kilometers? I mentioned that Yazi measures the whole column. So how do we handle the additional 10 kilometers of the atmosphere that we don't have any measurements? So we first looked at four profiles, um, integrating only up to the mixed layer. So this MLH is the mixed layer height. Um, and then using all the aircraft data, profile two, that's kind of shown in blue. And then just assuming, you know what, above the middle and upper troposphere, there's nothing. So we'll just call it zero from there on out. And then uh, part three is let's just do a simple extrapolation from the, whatever concentration was at the highest altitude back to zero at the tropopause. And then profile four as well, if it's at four kilometers in the free troposphere, if it's four ppb, we'll just assume the free troposphere is well mixed and, and put that four ppb all the way up to the tropopause. 
Now, ammonia has a short lifetime. Um, all the sources appear to be at the ground. There's really no reason to think ammonia should be really high up into the middle and free troposphere with, uh, with some exceptions. Um, so therefore, probably if we just take a look at these assumptions, probably profile one is the best assumption. We know that aircraft data has some biases and I'll talk about that and show that uh, very soon. But anyway, we still evaluated all four profiles. So I'm just showing the first three here, but um, so what's shown on the left is the Yazi column, and then on the right is the in-situ column as you integrated the in-situ profiles. And generally, you can see that if you look at the correlation coefficient, it degrades as you go um, to larger and larger, um, you know, higher and higher amounts of uh, ammonia in the atmosphere. Um, you know, as you bring that column up to the tropopause, you just basically start seeing a very low correlation. Um, the best correlation indeed happens where we assume that all the ammonia is in the mixed layer. And, you know, although this is somewhat uh, circular, you could say, well, you assume that's the best, so you're going to you get the best data. But it's also consistent with our physical and chemical understanding of ammonia. So from here on out, we're just going to assume that all the ammonia is in the in the mixed layer, and even though the atmosphere or the aircraft measures ammonia above that, we're going to discount that as a sampling artifact, and I'll show why in a bit. But generally, you can see if you take this assumption, the intercept is very close to zero. I know that 8.7 times 10 to the 14 means nothing, but just consider that to be a really, really small amount of ammonia. And the correlation looks pretty good, and the slope is one. And again, remember, we're talking about a satellite volume with perhaps a single profile from an aircraft. So there are space-time mismatches, but in general, it looks really good that I think we can trust these column amounts. So we've done um, various studies looking at, you know, if did we measure within 20 minutes of the satellite over past one hour or three hours? We've also looked at the spatial window. If we have measurements from the aircraft within the satellite pixel up to 45 kilometers away, and I'm not going to walk through this. You can, if you have questions about it, we can talk. But generally speaking, as the temporal window decreases, the correlation gets better. And generally, again, as the spatial window decreases, uh, the correlation improves. So if you have a really wide spatial window, wide temporal window, you're going to start seeing uh, lack of correlation. And those probably are not the best data sets to be validating against. Um, as shown down here, um, you know, these are the number of data points. Of course, the number of data where the overpass of the satellite was within the profile of the aircraft is relatively small. So these are weighted to some extent by the amount of data. But generally speaking, the satellite data looks really good um, for validation. Now, as I said, Yazi has been around uh, since about 2007. So what's shown uh, here are the various uh, profiles. What's on the left is version one. In the center is version two. And on the right is version three. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of what they represent. But what you can see is over time, you know, the one-to-one -one line is the dash, that the slope and the intercept and correlation are all much improved. Again, you know, you're comparing a snapshot in time with a uh, from the satellite of a volume with an aircraft profile that may only hit part of this. So there's a lot of scatter, but on balance at, you know, kind of individual pixel scales, it looks really good. Um, I'm not going to show uh, CRISP, but the same thing from their science team is happening. It's a newer, a little bit less uh, developed algorithm compared to Yazi, which they've been working on since 2007. But just uh, talking with the team, they are continuing to improve. Uh, various things such as cloud clearing, profiles, thermal contrast, and they're also showing significant improvements over time. So I think both Yazi and Chris are, are excellent uh, satellite-based ammonia measurements. Now, we can only validate when we have good measurements of temperature. And because ammonia is short-lived, it stays in the boundary layer. Um, so what's shown here is uh, the real-time product, which is, you know, the standard data you get off the uh, internet, at least the version, uh, what was called version 2.2, and then 
they also use a reanalysis product. What that means is over time, the near real time, because this goes back to 2007, at some point, the temperature or water vapor retrieval, of which the ammonia retrieval is dependent upon, uh, changed. And what you'll see is over long periods of time, you'll see discontinuities. So uh, be careful if you're just taking the satellite data over a long period of time. Make sure you're using what's called a reanalysis data set, which normalizes out any temperature or water vapor jumps uh, from the te corresponding temperature and water vapor measurements of the uh, MEDOP A and B satellites. And now there's MEDOP C, actually. If we actually take, because we have profiles of temperature for this campaign, if we take the actual temperatures involved and we reanalyze the data, you can see that you get a slope much closer to one. Um, and the correlation still is about the same. But the point is, you really need to have accurate temperature retrievals in the boundary layer. That impacts the accuracy a lot. So what does this mean? Well, during temperature inversions, uh, such as in valleys or winter time, the absolute accuracy may not be great for any individual set of points. Maybe on average, it may be okay. There's probably a bias from what we've seen, but you should use caution when using satellite data in winter time or in mountain valleys. And then I mentioned that the uh, in situ measurements themselves are not very good. Uh, well, I, I should say that, I mean, that's really uh, offensive to a lot of people who make a really hard measurement, but there are a lot of biases with the sampling of the uh, aircraft measurements. So what I just wanna show in the uh, middle panel here is a uh, profile in basically two similar regions. In blue is when the plane was descending and in red when the plane ascended. And what you can see is that at any given time, the ascending measurements after it's been in this really high ammonia boundary layer, it's much higher than the same basic measurements that it took you know, 15 or 20 minutes ago in a similar area. And these aren't really due to spatial gradients. It's really due to the fact that the instruments are having outgassing as they leave this ammonia-rich boundary layer, they get into the free troposphere, and there's some biases in the measurements. So that makes it really challenging, you know, when we talk about what is the future to validate these measurements. So what's shown in the orange are if we validate only using the ascent profiles, and what's shown in the uh, green are if we validate with the descent profiles. And you can see there's a fairly significant difference in both the slope, about a factor of two, um, and even the correlation. So there is still, even with these validated data sets, there's still uncertainty in the in situ measurements of ammonia, and that's because it's really hard to measure. So validation needs more work. Um, on balance, things look pretty good, but just be aware that temperature profiles of the boundary layer matter, and also if you're validating against in situ measurements to be aware of sampling artifacts. Okay, so now we're going to get into probably what I think um, are more interesting uh, applications of satellite ammonia. So these satellite measurements, they do a one pass a day, and, and Chris has a higher density of pixels than Yazi. But if you average over a fairly significant amount of time, like monthly or many years, what you can see on the lower right is over a single day, you see this is for Yazi you can see the individual pixels and how they're spread apart. But if you look at five days in a row, you start to see that they overlap. And I'm not gonna go into this oversampling algorithm, but this is widely done in sat other satellite uh, measurements. But if you start looking at how they overlap and the response of the detector to the satellite center versus the edges of the sat detector signal, you can come up with a way that you can actually get higher resolution and the native resolution or the pixel size of the satellite. So in this case, you're basically trading uh, temporal resolution, you're giving that up, but you're getting increased spatial resolution. And with this approach, we can get down to about two kilometers. This is the approach that we have been using that I'll show in this talk. There are other ways that you can do that with very similar uh, sort of uh, maps that you can get. So with this approach, we can really understand how ammonia is changing. So I'm gonna give an example here. This is the state of Colorado from the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment. These are locations of feedlots um, as a function of size, bigger circles are bigger feedlots, um, you know, and then different colors are whether it's 
you know, swine or dairies or cattle. Um, this is the city of Denver right here. So we did this oversampling over the entire uh, 2007 to 2016 uh, Yazi period. And what I'm going to do next is put the oversampling map uh, overlaid with Northeast Colorado, so kind of the Northeast quarter of this state of Colorado. And when you do that, you can clearly see where the high ammonia columns are, are almost identically located where the feedlots, where the emission sources are. Um, it's, it's not absolutely perfect, and, and I caution that this Yazi data is over about a 10-year period. The feedlot was from one year, so feedlots may come and go. They may not be at their same size the entire time. But I think it's absolutely striking how good the agreement is. And, and this really is important for trying to understand ammonia emissions in the atmosphere. So this is the type of information you can get from satellite. So now I want to go back to that highest Amon site in Utah. Again, it's located next to a farm. If the wind is coming from the farm, it may not be representative of that site as a whole. The X is the location of the site on this, this graph. If we do this oversampling algorithm in the Cache Valley, what you can see, according to satellite, the highest column amounts are actually in the northern part of the valley and not at that southern end. Now, does that mean the Amon is wrong? Absolutely not. Amon is measuring a concentration. Um, if the boundary layer is lower, by all means, uh, your concentration is going to be higher. Satellites measure columns, so to some extent, satellites are invariant to how high the boundary layer is. But of course, for all things being equal, a lower boundary layer is going to give you a higher concentration. But what this also shows is satellite can normalize for some of these local effects. And you know, in this case, um, you know, the Amon site, I, I won't say it's unrepresented. In fact, there have actually been some in situ measurements that show the values it sees are pretty representative of the entire valley. And I would say that's actually broadly consistent. There isn't a strong gradient across the valley, but satellite can help in this regard of taking one site and putting it in the context of a much uh, more regional, even local scale uh, phenomena. So I told you this Amon site had the highest concentration in the entire network. So we can use this oversampling map to really look at how this can compare nationally. So what's shown here are the uh, average ammonia uh, columns from Yazi taken over the entire time frame. This is about effectively two kilometer resolution. You can see uh, the Colorado uh, site that I just showed before. Here's the Cache Valley site. We can look at the ammonia uh, maps for the columns. Now, again, these aren't concentrations, they're columns. But we can get some information about the size of these you know, maps of ammonia. So the, 95th percentile is about 8 times 10 to the 15 molecules per centimeter squared. I know that doesn't mean anything unless you use the satellite sense, but if we use that value for the highest 5% of the ammonia columns, there are, by definition, using that, about 93 hotspots. The median area of a hotspot, the aerial weighted, is about 130 kilometers, and the typical length scale is about 30 kilometers. So these ammonia spots are incredibly small. I mean, sure, the central plains, which is the highest uh, when you weight the column by the aerial extent, that it looks pretty big. But I mean, look at Colorado, look at the Snake River Valley in Idaho, in Washington. Um, again, the San Joaquin Valley is large, but then there are also smaller hotspots, Lancaster County in, in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, the hog farms in North Carolina. Ammonia maps, the ammonia is going away very quickly. So I, I, again, I'll mention that this is not correlated. Well, they're, we've actually looked at this. They are correlated pretty well with emissions as well. But in terms of site placement, because the Amon site also measures concentrations, there are only 14 hotspots um, that have Amon sites. Um, of, well, let me rephrase that. Of the 14 hotspots, only five of them have an Amon site within 100 kilometers. And of those, only two of them have long-term data. So some of these are more recent. Like I said, the Amon network is growing rapidly. And I think that's a great thing because we need to have both satellite and surface to really understand it. And, and that's not to say that the Amon sites are bad or anything. It just depends what we're using them for. So if we want to put more Amon sites to study emissions, we may want to use these satellite maps to place more on the hotspots. If we're looking more downstream effects, such as deposition, 
then we actually don't want to be on the hotspot. So it really depends what the science objectives are. But now we have information that maybe we can uh, use to our advantage to put the next generation of the network in areas that maximize our science objectives. So this was brought up <clears throat> uh, in a study um, by Mosa Pachowski. Um, it's an environmental monitor. It's a magazine for stakeholders for air quality. And we, in this manuscript or in this paper, we talk about how satellites can be used to improve the surface monitoring network in terms of representativeness. Are we sampling hotspots or night or not and capturing spatial gradients? So this is a great article by Melissa, and I, I definitely want to uh, uh, point you toward this to kind of give a high-level view of how we can use this. Now, on the upper left here is the Yazi satellite, the map that I just showed. How does this compare to models? Now, of course, models need an emission inventory. So what's shown in the middle is from Fabian Pelot for the GFDL uh, AM3 uh, using the massage inventory, which is one that Fabian developed. And these are actually columns, so it's an apples to apples comparison. On the right, we have the CMAC from Jim Kelly and Jesse Bash at EPA. This uses uh, the NEI inventory. Um, I, for this, we're looking at the surface mixing ratio, but we've also looked at the columns and they're, they're generally pretty consistent. But if you look at all three, the general trends, you know, San Joaquin Valley, a hotspot in the Central Plains, and then various other hotspots around. But while those generally are true, you can see pretty big differences, both in the absolute amounts, like you know, the Yazi, the column amounts are you know, much higher by about a factor of two than uh, in massage. You can see difference in the relative intensities of different hotspots. You know, in CMAC, uh, at least the concentrations are comparable, say, to Iowa. In massage, it doesn't look like that. In Yazi, the column amounts, again, are also much different. So there are differences in the hotspots. There are differences in the amplitudes. And as you can see, there are differences in the spatial patterns. And I think this is one area that satellites can really help refine emission inventories. So the next question is, you know, I showed validation of Yazi, but how do Yazi and Chris compare? So what's on the upper left is the Yazi, the most uh, most recent publicly available version 2.2R that's using that reanalysis data set. So it normalizes out any discontinuities from temperature or water vapor from the satellite and uses the reanalysis data set to get a, a more uh, temporally uh, consistent data set. And then on the right is the CRIS using version 1.5 um, for a shorter time frame. But uh, you know, assuming the interannual differences are relatively small, over these time frames, which they generally are, you can see again very qual you know qualitatively good agreement. The hotspots show up, but then if you start looking at the absolute difference in the columns, and for this I just compared the Chris columns because Yazi doesn't report a surface concentration, but there are some differences. If we look at the ratio of these two in the bottom center, you can see that. Um, so a ratio of one means Yazi and Chris read the same. So you can see where it's red. That, that's a good sign. We, we like red because that's basically saying Yazi and Chris are seeing the same thing. Over a lot of these hotspot regions, Yazi and Chris do see the same thing. Where they differ is it looks like in these areas that are much lower concentration. This may have to do um, just with the, you know, basically the zero of the, uh, of the satellite. So there are differences, but where we probably use them most, they're actually pretty good. I mean, over the San Joaquin Valley, they read one over some of these hotspots. And I'm going to focus on Colorado here. So on the left is Yazi. In the center is Chris. And then again, the relative difference between them. Again, in this ratio of Yazi to Chris, red is one is what you want to see. Again, over the hotspot region, Around Greeley, it's one. Along the South Platte River Valley, it's one. With these feedlots out in eastern Colorado on the plains and Kansas and Nebraska, it's close to one. So I think this is a really good sign. Where we see differences are areas where there's really low ammonia, like over the Rocky Mountains. Um, so a difference of, you know, in this case, um, Chris is reading a much higher value, but it's a higher value of a very small number. So 
I would say in general over the hotspots, Yazi and Chris are very uh, consistent with one another, which is, is good for inversions. But annual maps don't tell you anything because ammonia is incredibly, the emissions vary by season. So what we show here are the monthly integrated Yazi maps uh, at this two kilometer resolution. And we can basically see how agriculture is breathing. So I'll let it start here in December and January and winter. The only real hotspot is the San Joaquin Valley. But then as you get into spring, you see these blooms in the central plains. They slowly move northward up into the Midwest. And then they start retreating back to the central high plains by July. And then the emissions start going down, although there are some peaks like in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania in the fall. And then as it cools down, the volatilization, which is where this, most of the ammonia is coming from, goes down. But I think it's amazing. You're watching agriculture breathe from satellite. And so often we think satellites are NOx and SOx and you know, CO and ozone, which are all great and are much more mature. But those are all fossil fuel, which are important, of course. But agriculture contributes an awful lot to air quality and greenhouse gases as well. So I think satellite ammonia can be really be useful for you know, quantifying as a tracer of agricultural activity. But it's, you can really see the dynamic, how the, these patterns shift with every month and how they retreat and how they intensify. And I want to focus a little bit more into that at the end here. Um, so this is the, for the entire U.S. So the seasonal pattern, which shown on the left, is the absolute difference between the maximum and minimum. And the point I want to make is in most of these hotspot regions, the difference is on the order of 10 to the 16 molecules per centimeter squared. What does that mean? I know, I know that that means something probably to me and a few others on this call, but for everyone else, nothing. It means that the, the satellite, that the ammonia emissions change incredibly much, sometimes by about a factor of 10 or more from their peak, which is a spring or summer typically versus the winter time. So, there's tremendous variability in the ammonia concentrations, and this is linked to the fact that the emissions are strongly temperature sensitive. So what's shown on the upper right is we did a clustering routine, uh, and basically you, you can kind of look at the patterns, like where, where are patterns consistent with their nearest neighbors? And so you get these different uh, clustering regimes. So, you know, this reg, you know, this, this blue map here, which is most of the Midwest and much of the, uh, at least the eastern part of the plains, shows uh, down below the, the normalized concentration, basically peaks around, you know, springtime, typically May, and it's a broad peak, and then it slowly goes down. Perhaps there's a little bit of shoulder in the spring, and this is pretty consistent with cropland activity. You have peak fertilization in May, uh, you know, depending further south, which is kind of more the, the yellow, the fertilization uh, happens sooner, and there's, there's uh, also less feedlots here, so you don't have volatilization, so the actual minima is in July. And then you see a secondary uh, peak in September, October, which may be related uh, to fertilization. In the western if part of the U.S., the western high plains and the Intermountain West, if you look at the red and the greens, what you can see are much sharper peaks. You don't see the springtime peak. You see it, it's much sharper compared to the blue. And, you know, in the northern part, it peaks in August. In the southern part, it peaks in July. And this is related to the fact that there are a lot more feedlots in this region. The hottest temperatures are July and August, which is consistent where the emissions are, the emissions are, are hottest in July and August, which is when the emissions are the highest. And indeed, that's when we see the highest uh, column abundance abundances from Yazi. So you can really start to see regional differences. Now, of course, there are feedlots, a lot of feedlots actually in parts of Iowa, and it's mixed croplands with feedlots. So in that regard, um, you know, you do see the, the fertilization of cropland peak, but there still are emissions in the summer, which is why the, this blue area, these mixed areas often have a very broad peak. But we can use these temporal patterns and spatial patterns to help constrain emission inventories. So related to that, so what I just showed is up on the top here with Yazi, and then uh, what's shown down below 
are basically CMAC AM3 and the AMON network. And I'm just going to quickly go through and state that basically CMAC and AM3 show general trends, but they're much narrower and don't show the diversity of these. So we can look at individual hotspots, again, comparing Yazi with CMAC AM3. Now here are the, the total columns uh, for California. We also have the AMON site, but that's also up in the foothills, about 300 meters higher. You can see for the San Joaquin Valley, there's some differences with AM3, and I'm just talking about the shape here. I'm not necessarily talking about absolute values. Um, but then you get into central Kansas, western Kansas, and you can see AM3 is sharper compared to CMAC uh, for the column months compared to Yazzie. And then this is Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and you can clearly see both AM3 and Yazzie show this double peak due to fertilization in spring and another fertilization peak in the fall, whereas CMAC, based on the NEI, is much more flat. So we can use these observations to really constrain. And by the way, your choice in the eastern U.S. of whether you have high amounts of ammonia, say, in March and February, relative to what the models are showing, make a big implication on uh, PM2.5. So just to finish up, I think ammonia is great for understanding spatial temporal trends, uh, for improving inventories. Currently, this is done at the county level, which is data collected by states and different data sources. Um, so I think ammonia, satellite ammonia, is great for constraining those. It's also great for uh, constraining the next generation of ground-based satellite measurements. It should be used with caution in winter uh, valleys, places of strong inversions. Um, satellite measurements are taken once per day, so you have to be aware that the emissions are highest in the afternoon when it's warmest. So pay attention and correct for diurnal patterns. I would still be a little bit cautious using absolute concentrations on the ground um, because of the spatial scales differences and the validation concerns. These are sensitive to temperature profiles, thermal contrast, and even the assumption of the ammonia vertical profile in the model that does the inversion itself. So um, it's not to say that we shouldn't be looking at. There's a lot of really good work by the Chris team doing that, but I still think that we need to uh, use these with caution. And Validation looks promising on average, but we really need more data sets to really do this, particularly over hotspot regions where the emissions um, are most important and may not reflect average space time averages that people have done the validation at this point. So with that, I thank you and I'm happy to take questions.